Um, so I'll start with a short introduction. Who are we? Um, who does the team consist of? And what was the background of this uh, project? Um, then we will talk a little bit about how we can extract information out of legal documents, which is one of the main themes or the main uh, goals that we have within this project. Um, then we'll dive a little bit deeper into what is an argument. And don't worry, we won't have a whole lecture series about arguments, but it's good to have some theoretical background about that. Uh, we go into some of those models, theoretical models that exist out there, and then how you can actually use those theoretical backgrounds and concepts in machine learning. So how do we use that to uh, really improve our AI solution? Um, then we talk a little bit about the data set that we're currently working with, uh, the models that we've been uh, trying out and deploying, and then a short discussion about what are we doing this for, and uh, what are the the main bottlenecks, drawbacks, uh, implications, etc. And if you have any questions in between, please ask me. Uh, I think it's nice to have it a bit, uh, to have an interactive discussion, to have an interactive presentation. You can also ask me questions in Dutch if you feel more comfortable uh, using Dutch. I hope everybody can follow when I just uh, speak like this. Um, so, AI for Justice 2022. It's a large project. Uh, there's uh, more than 300, there's almost 400k in the project, um, maybe even 400k if we get the final uh, signature. So it's quite a large project and also involves a lot of different tasks, different um, activities and different team members. It's part of the roadmap of national security, intelligence in action. Um, Peter is our project lead. Um, and what makes this project a bit special is that we collaborate with two different teams uh, from two different units even. And um, what we do see is that there's quite a lot of differences in culture, in approaches, in theoretical backgrounds. Um, so in the beginning, it took some time to get used to each other. We already started this process last year. And um, at this point, we really see the, the added value of uh, putting those two cultures together and really getting a bit more out of it. So basically, what I think the main difference consists of is that here at MSG, you're really looking to real-world applications and really thinking about what is the impact of a solution, um, where does it have to land, who should benefit from it. Whereas data science, we're more thinking about, okay, what's the coolest, newest algorithm and can we improve it a little bit and can we you know, somehow try it out in some kind of Jupyter notebook and we're more than happy if we don't get any error messages. You know, so this is basically where we come from. And it's, it's very nice to see that there's a lot of data engineering knowledge here and a lot of um, good practices in terms of coding and a lot of good practices in thinking about what should be the impact of a solution. Whereas from our side, we kind of tend to think and dream a little bit about, oh, but maybe you can improve it like this, or maybe this AI solution that was just uh, released on GitHub uh, might be a nice fit here. And we really try to find each other in the middle there. But it's also nice that we see a lot of cross contamination almost, where sometimes we from data science are starting to think a bit about the impact that a solution should make, we're starting to draw parallels with other projects that we've been working on in different domains, and then the MSG team coming up with the newest solutions, newest uh, models, architectures, etc., and trying those out. So we really do see that there's different cultures, but um, we seem to find each other quite well at this point. <laughs> so. Where did we start? Um, one of the stakeholders or the main stakeholder within this project is the Public Prosecutions Prosecutor's Office, the Openbaar Ministerie. And they have a couple of uh, main tasks that they are uh, working on. Um, first of all, they need to lead the police in, yeah, now I uh, have to translate Dutch, uh, legal Dutch into legal English, so good luck with that, but they, they have to, um, support the police and lead the police um, in going after criminals, basically. Uh, that's, uh, that's the main idea, and they kind of have to tell them uh, and, and direct them a little bit. Um, they need to prosecute criminal offenses. Um, they have to make sure that everybody who's been suspected of a crime is brought to justice. Um, but also, mm, brought to justice can mean that they have to appear in front of a judge, but sometimes it's also possible to take care of certain cases without the intervention of a judge and they can just, you know, um, write a boete. How do you say that? Uh, a fine. Yes, that's fine. So 
wel afdoen van strafbare feiten zonder tussenkomst van een rechter. So these are their main tasks and it takes up a lot of their time. And like in any other field nowadays, uh, they are under a lot of work pressure. They have a lot of work on their plate. They're always very stressed, um, apparently. So this was uh, in the news only a couple of weeks ago. Uh, turns out that most of the officieren van justitie, so um, prosecutors, I think, um, on average, they work more, uh, they have overtime 23%. So they, they do a lot of extra work during their work weeks. They're always very stressed, always very busy, uh, which amounts to about nine hours a week. So there's a lot of work pressure, there's a lot of work on their place. And of course, then the question becomes, can we make their life a little bit easier, but also can we make sure that the quality of their work is improved somehow, or at least maintained, using different types of solutions, technical solutions in our case. And just going back to their main tasks, uh, what they basically need to do all day is going through a lot of legal documents to get information out, to get re relevant um, information out. And they always say that this is one of their most time consuming tasks, getting relevant information out of legal texts. Um, so they need to assess the quality of work, uh, lines of argumentation and reasoning um, from documents from the Dutch police, um, so they can use that to prosecute somebody, so they can use it to file uh, specific types of um, requests, well, bijzondere opsporingsbevoegdheden, I don't think I, uh, I have the English term at hand there. Uh, but anyways, they need to go through so much text and they need to read and assess a, a lot of different things. And, um, they need to assess if the argumentation or the line of reasoning is complete, if it stands, um, if it could stand um, in a court of justice. And well, I think this picture kind of shows the, the situation they are in. And we're right now concerned with the question, can we somehow support them in those uh, activities? Can we somehow support them in getting these lines of reasoning out of texts, um, kind of identifying the different patterns that we see there? Are we able to draw? comparisons between different lines of reasoning from legal texts so that we can support them in their work, uh, so that we can make them a bit more resilient if people are misusing those lines of reasoning. Um, and also uh, think a little bit about what if we build some kind of AI solution, uh, how safe it is, uh, how safe is it to share this AI solution across organizations or how safe is it to share information concerning uh, the line of work that we're doing across organizations. Um, but before you can build any technical solution or look into AI, you kind of have to start to understand what are we trying to extract from these texts. And those are arguments in this case. We want to get lines of reasoning or argumentations out of a text. And then we first dove into the literature to kind of see what an argument is. And there's all kinds of theoretical models related to argument mining or arguments and argumentation. And you can give a whole lecture series about it. I think they do it at the Nederlands Studi Dutch Studies. And if you're interested, you can always go there. But basically, this is one of the older models that you always see in the literature, that, that a typical line of reasoning consists of different parts, which are related in a certain way to each other. Uh, not all of them are obligatory, but what you basically see is that there's some kind of grounds that are being used. There's backing of those grounds, a warrant, a qualifier, a claim, rebuttal. Uh, you might uh, go against a certain argumentation. So there are dogs nearby, unless there are wolves or coyotes nearby. Right. So there's all kinds of little elements within arguments and within lines of reasoning that you can identify and that people have built theoretical frameworks of. So that's very nice, but we're not here to uh, give a qualitative analysis of argumentation models. Fortunately, other people did that for us. Um, there's all kinds of frameworks, so people are not agreeing among each other. What is the typical, typical structure of an argument? Uh, so there's all different kinds of approaches, all different kinds of ways to go about that. And then again, if you look into uh, ways to transform that into a technical solution, this is really hard to work with. It's really hard to translate this into something that we can actually get into a computer, right? If you just look at all the different options, all the different approaches, it's really hard to know what should we do. 
So what you then basically start with, we read some of the articles, we concluded, okay, this is really complicated. Um, there's a very low chance that we will be able to build a perfect argumentation mining pipeline based on all these theories uh, by ourselves. So we really need to st start to stand on shoulders from other people and really start to look around what other people have been doing and see how well we can implement that in our specific use case. And it will probably not be the best, it will probably not be the ground truth, but people are not even agreeing among themselves what they consider a valid theoretical uh, model of arguments. So we just looked at these models and we concluded, okay, it's just really nice to start to look into the literature. And then we got into argumentation mining. So fortunately, people have been concerning themselves with extracting arguments, relations between arguments, parts of arguments from text automatically using natural language processing, using uh, regular expressions, using machine learning. Uh, that field is called argumentation mining. Now you have information mining, text mining, and then also argument mining, which is specifically aimed at this problem of getting argumentation structures out of text. And we thought, okay, it would be really nice if we can support the public prosecutors uh, with their activities by automating or partly automating the process of, of extracting arguments out of the text and relations between arguments so that we know if one argument is actually uh, a, quali uh, a rebuttal of the other argument or how those little parts are related to each other. They strengthen each other or they really form an argument against, etc. We came across a nice data set and we also started to visualize it. So this is something that Olaf uh, built. As you know, he's really good with uh, building very nice interactive visualizations. So ask him if you want to uh, explore this data set. It's a really nice, uh, uh, quick solution that works really smoothly. Uh, already one of the first successes of the project, I would say, because we did find a tool that was extremely slow. And then Olaf looked at it and with some magic, he got this working. And here you basically see the structure of a whole argument um, with different parts of the arguments, the different relations between those arguments. So this is inferred from this one, etc. And then you can really start to explore how a text is constructed, basically. When I say um, extracting arguments, argument mining using machine learning models, then it, it might be good to just have a quick look at what can you do with machine learning models. And what we have here actually is a classification problem. So we have a bunch of text, and we want to determine if certain parts of the text are an argument or an argumentative unit, or if they are a neutral part of the text. So that's the first step that we're taking. Just very bluntly, if you have a full text, where can you find the arguments that are being used in the text? And for that, we actually use a classification algorithm. So a classification algorithm is basically an algorithm that is able to distinguish between, well, in this case, two different types of sentences or two different types of classes, class A, class B. And then in the ideal situation, there's a certain distribution of those two classes, and you're able to draw a line between them and have a model tell you on which part of the line any new instance falls. So that's the, the argument detection algorithm that we have been implementing. And typically when you have a classification algorithm, what you need is a data set with labels. So a huge data set that tells you if something belongs to class A or to class B. So you can learn a model to distinguish between those two classes. But we also have a problem because it's quite hard to determine what is an argument and what is not an argument. And we also need labels to determine that for us. So we also, um, besides only looking at classification algorithms, we also took out another trick from the machine learning community, and that's transfer learning. So basically, it's really hard to make a distinction between uh, parts of text that are argumentative and parts of text that are not argumentative. And it's really nice. Um, what you typically see with these machine learning algorithms is that they get a lot better if you feed them more labeled data. Yeah, so they get better and better with more data, with more instances, with more to learn from. 
However, typically you don't have a large data set with a lot of labels. Um, we did find a data set with some labels, uh, but what you then get in the situation is that you have a certain solution, you learn a model over it, you have another situation, you learn another model over it, and there's not a lot of overlap or you're not really using the knowledge from one model into the other. But what we're also using here is something that we call transfer learning. So basically the idea there is that you learn over or somebody else learned over another data set, got some knowledge out of that, and that is then being transferred into the learning a new model. So basically we use a pre-trained model that has been trained on data to distinguish between arguments and non-arguments. And then we take this pre-trained model. Uh, this pre-trained model has also been learned on the distribution of the English language, so huge amounts of text. So this is the BERT model that you oftentimes hear about. It's a deep learning model that has been trained to learn patterns, so to say, in the English language by giving it massive amounts of text. Also applying transfer learning. So again, we don't have to feed the model all these information ourselves. We're just taking advantage of the fact that somebody else did that on huge infrastructure. So that's, that's basically the idea of transfer learning, which we also applied here in this project. And then we got into uh, this architecture. So we um, had a clear idea of the problem. We had some ideas about the machine learning solutions that are out there, uh, also thinking about can we apply this transfer learning concept, so can we actually take the knowledge and uh, the ideas from other people and then start building from there. And this is where the, really the knowledge of MSG uh, is essential, I found, because here you have a lot of knowledge on how can we build something that actually works, and not just on my laptop in my Jupyter notebook once, but something that is in a, a nice pipeline, in a strong architecture that is hopefully in a couple of iterations ready to you know, reach a higher technical readiness level. So that was a very nice way of collaborating with each other, having these discussions about, okay, what parts do you need if you actually want to support the uh, public prosecutors? Uh, what is necessary if you want to perform this argument mining? And how do we put this into an architecture and into a solution that will actually you know, stay afloat when we throw it out in the real world? So we came up with a certain architecture. We built a pipeline um, where we introduce a text. The text is being segmented into sentences for now. And for each and every single sentence, we have a machine learning model tell us whether or not this sentence is a argumentative part or a neutral part of the text. So that's this classification problem, basically, that we're using. And for that, we're using a pre-trained model, a BERT model. Uh, Damian knows all about it. Bert Arch, Robert Arch, it's called. Um, so it's a very powerful architecture, and then we'll dive a little bit into how well it performs, actually, in a minute. And what you get out of this model is these labels that tell you, okay, these parts of the text may contain an argumentative part, and these are probably irrelevant. You already have a first filtering of your results. And then um, all these pairs of, or all the argumentative parts that are within this text are then being laid next to each other, all the pairs that we have. And then we have another model make a prediction about the relationship between those two parts. So what is the relation between those two? Is it a rebuttal or are they unrelated? Or And I, I think you know very well that if you start to do pairwise comparisons over the whole set of sentences, then you know, your solution starts to explode. So of course, there's some intelligence in there and that we do restrict it a bit. I'm not sure if that's already implemented, but we had some discussions. It does not make sense to compare every single sentence with every other single sentence if you want to know the relationship. I mean, there is a specific. Uh, after a couple of paragraphs, there's very little chance that a certain sentence will be related to another sentence that's being mentioned. So there you can kind of restrict the search space. So this is basically our pipeline that we have uh, standing right now that we've been experimenting with. But then, of course, uh, if you build something like this, you also want to know how well it works. You want to have some idea of, OK, um, if we do deploy this in the real world, if we do have a data set, does it work? Yeah, give, does it give us any nice um, results that we can work with? For so, that so, use, uh, um, yeah, so we want to evaluate uh, the solution, right? And for that, we need a data set with labels. 
So we can actually compare the ground truth or the labels that have been given to this uh, data set to what our model predicts. And then we can see the delta between those two. And this is also one of the main issues that we've been encountering in this project is the lack of valid, nice, clean data sets that you can use to evaluate and train your machine learning solution on regarding argument mining. There's just not that many data sets with arguments that have been annotated by hand by experts. Uh, we did manage to find one, a very nice one, very interesting one. Um, it's about um, presidential debates in uh, 2016 from the US. Um, and not only is there data um, from the candidates arguing with each other using all kinds of arguments, but also the reactions on social media from people watching those debates. So you can imagine that the type of texts you get out of it, um, you know, I'll kill a bitch, to, you know, those are the kind of texts that we uh, also encounter in these data sets. Um, so the, the type of language that is being used is highly variant. So it can be uh, all caps, it can be very um, nasty words, it can be very long sentences with very well, um, uh, very eloquent lines of reasoning. There's all kinds of things in there, but of course it's also President Trump, so we're not uh, expecting a lot of quality in his speech maybe, but still, uh, it's a very interesting uh, data set in that regard uh, with a lot of variation. Uh, but that's also quite challenging if you want to transfer what you learn from that data set into the real world or onto documents from, uh, from the OM, because that's quite different, right? The, the context, the type of language that's being used is quite different. So that's, that's already a big bottleneck that we have, but we don't have a lot of other data sets that we can use. So we, we do need to start from somewhere. We do need to have some kind of baseline. Um, so this data set has been um, labeled both for uh, whether or not a certain piece of text is an argument and also the relationship between those argumentative units. So there's um, almost 400 files um, containing over 12,000 sentences that have been labeled by hand. Um, and they've been labeled and the whole process of labeling and the choices they made have been described in the paper uh, by Fisser et al. And this is basically what the data set looked like. Uh, Anne Merel uh, really, really, really had a hard time parsing it because the structure was terrible. I mean, we worked really hard on getting the data in a certain format so that we could actually use it. So a lot of time went into cleaning the data, getting the correct relationships out, getting the right data out. So that's already also a problem that you always encounter. If there's a data set, you're happy, but then you still need to put a lot of work and effort into that. And what we did, uh, once we got the data out, after a lot of uh, long and hard thinking and uh, a lot of uh, effort uh, by the team, uh, which I did not put on the slide, but uh, believe me, that was uh, high quality work. I'm uh, really, uh, really happy that we got it uh, going. Um, then we started to deploy several models on our data set. Um, and always you can, of course, always throw a deep learning model at your data, but it's also very nice to know how well a very simple solution works, a no-nonsense solution. So what if you're just uh, detecting the word because? Maybe if you just you, uh, detect the word because, you will get all the argumentative sentences out, and that might be enough, right? Uh, or just a very simple glass box machine learning model. So uh, the, the, the more traditional kinds of models, uh, maybe they work really well. Or maybe you do need a deep learning solution. Yeah, this is always the question. So this is why we also started to experiment with different types of models, so to say. So we had an argument detection model uh, based on a deep learning architecture. So that's Robert Arg. That's one of those uh, bird models that are really famous within the natural language processing. Um, but also some linear models. Um, so just scanning the text for argumentative sequences. So if the word because is present in the text, then we mark it or we label it as an argument. If it's not, we don't do that. I, I think there's actually a whole list of, of uh, terms that we use that we define by hand. Um, and then we can compare that with uh, the actual labels. Um, and then some what we call gla glass box machine learning models, naive Bayes, logistic regression, uh, linear SVCs. And for argument relations, so getting the relationship between two argumentative units, um, we use a deep learning model called um, 
relation arg, I think. Argument relation, thank you. Yeah, oh, it's, it's even in the, on the slides. And then when you start doing that, you get a lot of numbers out. So let me just walk you through what we see here. Um, oh, and this also shows you how labor intensive it can be to deploy a machine learning model. It's not just a matter of pushing a button and then hoping something that comes out of it, but you also need to think about, okay, which models, which order, uh, how do I pre-process the data, um, what choices do I make? Because there's all kinds of choices you can make in how you translate the text into something a computer can, compu uh, can perform calculations over. So you need to translate the text into numbers. So that's all kinds of choices that you're making, which are features or setting what you see here. So first of all, we experimented with different models. And for every single model, we experimented with different ways of translating the text into numbers. Um, if you're interested, uh, you can always ask me what those uh, features are. But for now, I'm just going to skip over and go a bit uh, through the numbers with you. And uh, what you typically see if you see these big boxes of numbers is that people use boldface to indicate which is the best model. So if you ever come across these, uh, these tables, just look for the bold face and uh, there you are. Um, so somehow we were a bit relieved to see that the very naive solution, just using uh, regular expressions and detecting where is the word because used, um, did perform well, quite well, so there's some numbers here, but it's not the best solution. So yeah, maybe it's, it's not good news, but as, as a machine learning engineer, we're always happy to see that uh, you know, our knowledge is not for nothing. We can you know, at least use it. Um, and what you see here, these numbers, accuracy, precision, recall, F1 score, they kind of tell you a bit about um, how many instances were correctly identified how many instances were incorrectly um, identified, uh, which ones were left out. Uh, you can do all kinds of ratios between um, false positives, false negatives, etc. I think you will know this story about um, what do you want to optimize for? Do you want to make sure that whatever you find is actually correct? Or are you more concerned about finding as much as possible and there might be some incorrect cases there, but at least you did not miss anything. So you always have to balance this. So if you do, uh, for example, a blood test or a corona test, then it's, it's very nice if it detects even uh, incorrectly that you have COVID. You prefer that over missing about 25% of people that have been infect uh, infected, right? So there's always this balance. And that's basically what these different metrics represent, the different choices in what you find more important, getting everything correct or not missing any cases. Um, but here we see that uh, using a glass box model um, actually gives us the best results here. And I don't think, yeah, here we also have one linear, but so this is all linear models. You know, we can see that there is a very nice recall, a very nice high number. Um, Damian, am I missing something here? No, on that part, it's in blue, the slide down below. Mm -hmm. the, the accuracy is about 0.52. Mm -hmm. And intuitively, that's not that good. But after fine tuning, we were able to get it up to 95, mm -hmm. so 0.95. But that's also because it learned the the, uh, the traits of the data set, not necessarily the argument detection. Mm -hmm. So the data set has weird traits, and Robert Karg uh, was able to learn those weird traits, and thus, thus was good at uh, identifying uh, Yeah, this is always a problem. Um, you can learn a very good model, that is very well suited to predict what is happening within your data set. But does it generalize? Yeah. Is that also an artifact of the data set itself? Because you mentioned that it had edit comments, and mm -hmm. all those people are not literature per se. So no, they don't have uh, PhD literature, typically. Yeah. No, but they, they, a comment wouldn't be a paragraph, or mm -hmm. perhaps two paragraphs. So it wouldn't mm -hmm. also be an artifact that you're looking for uh, a correlation between sentences or paragraphs Definitely. that is impossible to see. Definitely. There. Yeah, and also a big shortcoming in the field, I would say, because most people are, like, everything that we found um, takes as an assumption, and they all acknowledge the assumption is wrong, that an uh, argumentative unit is one sentence. But it's just really easy to chop up a, set, uh, a text into sentences because you have this period as a break, right? Um, so that's already a big shortcoming, and that indeed is reflected into the model that you fit into this data. 
Because, yeah, of course, some arguments are maybe half a sentence. Some arguments are maybe a full paragraph. And at this point, there's no way of knowing. So that's, uh, that's indeed a big shortcoming that we also acknowledge, but we haven't found any solutions to that yet. Maybe at the end of the year, in December, we're pushing for it, but uh, that, that's a very hard problem indeed, and nobody else has dared to touch that. And unfortunately, people on Reddit uh, tend to not use punctuation. <laughs> in formal yes. writing, we're used to uh, uh, exclamation marks and, and uh, mm -hmm. full stops. But when does a sentence end is mm -hmm. sometimes a problem in Reddit data sets. So that's a lot. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes it's a very nice, uh, yeah. Yeah. nice way of saying it. But uh, yeah, and that, that's another complication. So first of all, um, the complication of, of chopping the text up into units that make sense. Then, of course, it's uh, noisy, user-generated data, like Twitter, like uh, Reddit, like there's a whole different category of text there. And while the variants, um, writers, non-native speakers, it's a mess. Um, there's even uh, separate language models for uh, noisy, user-generated text. It's also always a topic in uh, linguistics conferences, like, oh, what do we do with this? Terrible. We cannot do anything with it. Uh, big problem for open source Intel, of course. So it's it's um, definitely um, a complicating factor. Let's uh, let's put it like that. Yeah, Frieden. Yeah, it might be lost a bit, but uh, if numbers are on that twelve thousand sentence set. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and could you split that, or what sure. are we looking at? Uh, yeah. So uh, you can see next to the, the the model used, you can see twenty percent and one hundred percent because. Uh, the top model is 100%, okay. and it makes no sense because it's not really, uh, it's just, is there because in it, then we conclude that it's an argument. Okay. There's no training taking place, so it's 100%. And the 20% is the size of the test set, basically. Okay. Yeah. 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 Good, I'll hurry up. Ah, and here, it's also nice to know that there is a, um, so this is all an argument detection. We also looked at argument relationships. Um, in the paper, they got kind of a low score. You know, it turns out to be quite hard to determine what is the relationship between two argumentative units. Also because that's not a binary problem. Um, there can be more than two relationships between sentences. So <coughs> that already makes it a bit harder to get it correct. Uh, the F1 score on screen is to, uh, after applying it to the data set we have. Yeah. And the biggest problem is that the pre-trained model argument relation has six labels, and mm -hmm. we're only interested in four labels. So two of the labels were constantly mm -hmm. predicted, while well, it wasn't applicable to our data set. So another problem in interoperability. So sometimes you have a very nice uh, pre-trained model that has been trained on five categories, and your data has four, or five different categories. And then you have to see what do we do with that. And that also requires some engineering, as you say, and uh, creative. Uh, so that's also a lot of work, a lot of hours of thinking that you don't see reflected on the slides, but that's uh, always there. Um, so basically what we uh, have so far is, um, yeah, it's, it's difficult. <laughs> it's kind of complex, it's complicated, um, also a very interesting problem. Um, there's a lot of things uh, we can do there, but also it's, it's very hard to get it right. And um, what we, um, do see is that on this current data set that we have, we, we did get some insights, we do have some feeling for what type of model works, we have some feeling about what a potential solution might look like, how well it may perform, um, and then we also saw that of course argument detection is a lot easier to do, um, and there we see that if you apply deep learning, it's slightly better than just using a, a regular machine learning model, but it's only slightly, so if there's a very big um, request for having a transparent model or something that you can explain, um, then we, we can be confident in saying that, okay, we can also use a, a more transparent model in this case, that, that will also work more or less. Um, but for argument relationship, because there's different relationships, that there's different labels, we really do see that applying deep learning does get you better results. And there the, the, the advice would definitely be go for the more complex model. Otherwise, you won't get enough out of it. Um, but yeah, just to look at the data set and not just the fact that it's been generated by um, people, uh, we also have the problem that people also labeled this data set. And yeah, th those were people with PhDs, but still uh, very inconsistent. And um, yeah, so uh, it's 
also labeled by humans, of course, but it's uh -huh. context dependent. So sure. there could be a context where thank you could be an argument, mm -hmm. and we're uh, segmenting it into sentences. So the context is lost, basically. And uh, the argumentation and the, the, the labels of the argumentation is context dependent, while our sentence segmentation is uh, losing that context. Yeah, so there seems to be some inconsistencies that are really not inconsistencies, it's just because of the context. But there's also some where we as a team all thought, well, you know, this really feels like an argument, right? So, uh, yes, we have to defend ourselves against terrorism, but there are ways to do that without impinging on our constitutional rights and our privacy rights. Feels a bit argumentative, as we thought. And here, um, but let's not pretend that Latin American immigrants aren't often at a severely disadvantaged position as well. According to the labelers, so the annotators, it was a non-argument. We think differently. So they already see that's also a complication because what you put into your model is what you're getting out of it. And if that's inconsistent, if that's hard to label, if that's hard to define, yeah, then how are you going to teach a machine learning model what to do? So that's also a big challenge that we're facing. And sometimes it's better to uh, label it yourselves and have a very clear idea on you know, the categories that you're after and, and have a very clear annotation scheme and really have standards uh, that you can use there. So that, that's also a big um, uh, bottleneck. Would you say that if you put uh, short-term memory or uh, something like that in mm -hmm. your learning algorithm, would that, that impact your results? Would that actually give mm -hmm. you the context, or would that not be worth that much? Yeah, that would be possible, I guess, uh, but it would be a challenge to, because, uh, uh, okay, there's a lot of sensors in one file we're interested in, mm -hmm. and to what extent are you interested in past? You could try it, but uh, there's some obstacles, mm -hmm. it's interesting. Yeah, yeah there's all, uh, also only so, so much you can yeah. put into a single factor. And also, so there's, there's some computational, computational limits, limits there, so that, that's also, uh, there's always only these 512 tokens that you can get into a BERT model. So it's, it's, um, it does require some creative solutions, and uh, we're not there yet, but it's a good question. Um, also, yeah, of course, the OM, all the documents are mostly in Dutch. So and you do want to know how well does it transfer, not only to their context, but also to the language. Um, we did run some small experiments on a small Flemish data set that we managed to find. Um, it seems to be the case that at least for the detection of argumentative uh, units, uh, we can get an F1 score of 0 0.7, which is quite acceptable. So that seems to be the case, uh, although we do need to fine-tune and train things. and uh, so. We are confident that uh, we'll be able to apply it to the Dutch context, but we do think that the performance will be a lot lower and will require some fine tuning, et cetera. And then the question becomes, how much do we lose? Uh, this is a problem that we see all over the place in every type of field and, and use case of machine learning, especially with language models. As soon as you switch to a different context, and especially if you switch languages, um, it's hard to say how much you lose. I don't understand uh, sure. what, what you're doing. <coughs> you can use the pre-trained model with your language. You explain that. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you mean, mean uh, uh, so there's a, um, so the idea is, is that if you want, have, want to have a computer make a model out of your texts, which have been labeled, then the computer has to be able to um, perform computations over your text. And uh, you cannot perform computations over letters. You have to somehow transform them into numbers, into vectors, into a uh, numeric representation. And this numeric representation could be what they used to do many, many years ago just by frequency numbers. So we know that the word the occurs uh, 35 times, so we just give that a certain number or we give it a certain index. So one-hot encoding was one of those old tricks. Uh, you can look at the normalized frequency measures where you kind of look at uh, how diverse a certain word is across documents to get an informational value out of it. Or what we nowadays use are pre-trained language models. And basically those are the weights of a neural network that has been uh, going over huge amounts of text where people have been taking out words out of the text and then have the machine learning model predict 
what is the missing word? So, uh, for example, there would be a sentence like, uh, the mm -hmm are swimming in the sea. And then you ask your machine learning model to predict which is the missing word. So in this case, it would be fish. Um, and if you let the machine run this um, uh, predictions over huge amounts of sentences for many, many iterations, uh, then you get a ne neural network that is able to kind of more or less accurately predict which are the missing words. And the weights from this neural network are the representations that we use. So we kind of have these weights of the model that tell you what is the most likely prediction of a missing word. And the idea is uh, why this works is that the context of a word and uh, the whole um, prediction of where a word fits in a certain sentence tells you a lot about the meaning of that word. So if you're able to predict based on words like sea, swimming, and uh, uh, salt, that it's probably about fish in the sea, uh, you learn something about the meaning of the word fish. Whereas if you say uh, flew into a tree, then it likely is a bird. So that, that's basically how these um, language models work. But then if you learn about these distributional features in a language, um, then the language itself becomes really important. So you have a model that has been learned over many, many, many sentences of English, but that model is useless if you want to use it for Dutch because it's, it, it, had, it didn't learn to generalize to Dutch. Of course, those languages are more or less comparable, same language group, et cetera, so there is some transfer learning possible there, but it's better if you learned it on a huge set of Dutch sentences. So that, that's basically the idea of these pre-trained language models, and there's all kinds of neural architectures and five minutes, thank you, uh, neural architectures and things you can do. So this mask um, words prediction task is just one of the ways to try to learn a neural network, uh, the distributional features of your language. Um, <coughs> nowadays we have all kinds of uh, very fancy, complicated uh, networks. It's, it's a bit hard to explain without a picture. I, I hope I'm making myself clear. Dutch. Uh, so, uh, so what you'd like to explain uh, was the sure. embedding, uh, the embedding network for your... Yeah, for your sure. so there's a Dutch pre-trained language model that we can use uh, there. Okay. Yeah. And, and I mean, is that, is that sort of standardized? That, because the other part is, of course, the argument detection. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have a standardized mm -hmm. interface between those two systems? Yeah, so basically this whole word architecture is kind of a plug and play, so you can have your standardized uh, word embeddings uh, layer, layers basically, so that's uh, 12 to 24 layers depending on which architecture you take. And then on top of that there's typical a certain task, so that could be a classification, that could be uh, binary, multi-class, etc. So they're, they're basically stacked, those two models, on top of each other. So we can take out the English uh, word embeddings and plug in a Dutch word embedding model and still have the same classification part of the bird model. Um, that works. Why is it um, difficult to transfer it to, to Dutch? Uh, um, well, it's not difficult in terms of coding. It's uh, okay. difficult in terms of getting the same results. No, it's already been pre-trained, so that's not the issue. The issue is the performances and um, the, the quality of the results. Because getting the same quality that you get for English language is next to impossible to get for the Dutch language. You often see that there's a huge drop in performance. The weights of the part you're not substituting <coughs> are in part related to the language processing part. Could be. That's also a setting that you can choose. Um, yeah, that, that, that really depends. That's also one of the things you can, uh, buttons you can use. We, we only have a few minutes mm -hmm. left. So let's park these questions mm -hmm. for perhaps a follow-on discussion. Uh, because you, perhaps you have mm -hmm. still a few slides that are important to share. I have, I have two. <coughs> um, so basically we have some use cases within the um, Open Mind Ministry, kind of show us what we're doing this for, and the potential applications that they see for these technologies. And I also have a slide on um, what's next. So what are we going to work on next? So I'm, maybe we have a certain preference. You <coughs> applications, sure. Let me just uh, take a sip of water. Hmm. 
Okay, so this will be a bit hard to translate into English again, so sorry for the, with a lot of Dutch terminology in, uh, in between. Um, yeah, we, we had this idea of uh, applying this to a specific data set, but that uh, turned out not to be so relevant for our use case. So I'm just going to skip over the phase one and just go through the phase two because those are some of the potential applications of these technologies that the OM, the Open Mar Ministerie, mentioned to us. So we really fast forward a couple of years in the future where we manage to have a better argument detection mining uh, model, fine-tuned for Dutch, fine-tuned for legal cases, then it might be possible to support them in all kinds of <coughs> activities. Mm. So for example, um, there's something that's called the 12 SV procedures, <coughs> which sorry, I'm, I'm just going to read it out in Dutch because it's, I, I don't know how to translate it. So it's a procedure to make a decision against the decision taken by the officer of justice. Uh, and there, a lot of arguments are being given about why this should be the case. Uh, it will be really nice for them to have an overview of the types of arguments that are being used in these bezwaarschriften. <coughs> Not only to have insights on them, but also to be able to draw some comparisons, have some historical insights, uh, to classify them also, so what types of um, uh, bezwaren do people make. And they really hope that these technologies can help them support in that so that they don't have to go through it all by hand, but they also have some kind of tool that helps them to create some overview, to create some order in the chaos. And they can all actually learn from each other in a more efficient way and so uh, keep the quality high. Um, same goes for a process for bad telephone tops. Um, that zijn nu losse verzoeken aan officier van justitie. Uh, welke argumenten zijn er voor in het plaatsen van een tap? Welke argumenten zijn er tegen? Uh, ook daar is het uh, very useful to have an overview, to, to have an historical um, database, basically. It can also be used to train uh, new colleagues um, to learn, uh, to have some kind of case law um, documentation, basically, in jurisprudentie. Um, en also verzoeken om getuigen te horen, wordt voorgelegd aan de rechter commissaris. Dat is nu iets wat bovenop de caseload van een officier komt. Dat ook ontzettend tijdrovend is. En de OM benoemde daar dat het heel mooi zou zijn als we daar ook ondersteuning kunnen bieden. Ook omdat ze daar al met hun ketenpartner naar aan het kijken zijn. Uh, ze hopen daar ook wat meer samenwerking in het hele proces uh, voor elkaar te kunnen krijgen. En als daar ook wat ondersteuning in komt in de vorm van uh, mining van uh, stukken. En het inzichtelijk maken van een aantal relevante stukken. Dan zou ze dat ook enorm uh, helpen en uit de brand helpen. And, and also when we talked to them, um, I think it was two or three weeks ago, they also mentioned that for, for example, Mulder Zaken, Snelheidsovertraining, etc. Millions of them every year. So even if it saves them 10 seconds of their time per case, times, you know, many, many cases, that's, that's really valuable. But getting there is uh, challenging. That's unfortunately, it won't be ready uh, next week. Um, but they do see a lot of value in uh, what we're trying to develop here. Um, so yeah, argumentation mining, that's, that's the first part that we're working on. We also have some other work packages where we look into resilience. So what if you have a lot of insight into what arguments are there and what arguments have a large effect on somebody? You can well, basically weaponize that in a way, especially if there's an um, unbalanced uh, knowledge position uh, it might be used in a um, wrong way, so you want to be resilient against the adversarial use, so to say, of, um, of your arguments, uh, argumentation mining applications, so that you can start to recognize when somebody is trying to hit your weak spots. And also sensitive data, so all these models, all these uh, thing, things that we're developing, can they be shared across organizations? Or if I do share this information trained on a data set from uh, the OM, uh, is it possible for another party to get the um, contents of the training data out? You know, how careful should we be when we use these kinds of uh, models? So that's it. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions. <laughs>